welcome to the Tres Vista Talk podcast, where we engage with senior asset managers and advisors across a broad range of topics. Tres Vista is the leading outsourcing firm for the financial services industry, supporting over 1,000 clients with over 10 trillion in assets under management. Hello, this is Abhilash Jaykumar, co-founder and managing director of Tres Vista. On today's Tres Vista Talk, I have the pleasure of speaking with my good friend and client, Eric Becker. Eric, welcome. Thank you, Abby. So nice to be here. Thank you so much. Yes. You know, Eric, you've had a really interesting journey over your career as a business builder and manager and entrepreneur. And I've always said there's three types of managers. You know, the folks who start businesses who are great at working in an unstructured environment and getting their hands dirty and building something. The growth managers who can institutionalize something and take it to the next level. And the large company managers, right, where you have a lot of senior people, so it's a lot of managing stakeholders and egos. And you've done all of those type of things. You've been a serial entrepreneur, you've grown business, and you've sat on top of large organizations. Can you talk about you know, your journey, where you started, and sure. which of these hats you prefer wearing the best? Well, it's interesting because I hadn't heard it described that way, and I think it's uh, uh, wonderful the way you articulate those differences. And immediately when you said them, my favorite part is the entrepreneurial part, um, and I have done all three. But, uh, but my journey started in, in Baltimore. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland originally. Um, my grandfather um, wrote the nightlife column for the newspaper and played the violin and had a, a nightclub in Baltimore. Um, my father was the first person in our family to go to college and went to University of Maryland. And I was very, very lucky to have an entrepreneurial dad. My father, to work his way through school, hired his fraternity brothers to dress up like Santa Claus and he rented them to department stores like a Kelly Temporary Services business model. And um, ultimately, as only can happen in America, my father became the king of Christmas. Uh, the, the, strap, the original department stores became strip shopping centers and then shopping centers became regional malls. And over time, there were all these huge displays where people would take their kids to have photo taken with Santa. And my dad built it and had that company for 53 years from college all the way to his retirement. So um, I had this wonderful dad and an example of, um, of both what to do and also maybe some lessons and what not to do in business as an entrepreneur, particularly in an incredibly seasonal uh, but fun business of Christmas. So that was that was my my beginnings, and I had all the benefits of the next generation, um, both the mentorship um, of of having an entrepreneurial dad. In fact, I actually was thinking about it this morning before uh, before this uh, session. When I was 12 years old, my father said, "I'm going to take you to a business meeting." I didn't really know what a business meeting was. And I went with him on a flight from Baltimore to Boston and met some of his customers. And it was such an eye opener for a young kid to see my dad in that environment, the relationships that he had with his customers, um, the personal relationship, the trust. Um, it was a real eye opener for a kid because I only knew him through family. And, um, and so that was an amazing experience. And then I also thought um, this morning of learning about business models and how my dad took me to a McDonald's. I, I said I wanted to get a Happy Meal, and my father turned it into this business lesson where he said, we'll go to McDonald's, but we're gonna talk about it on the ride over. And on the ride over, he said, so you can be a customer of McDonald's. We're going there to, to get you a Happy Meal. Or you could work at McDonald's. Those are the people that make the food and make it happen and make it an experience. You could own the McDonald's. You don't know this, but it's a franchise. And so you can actually own the McDonald's. You could be McDonald's, the corporate parent, and you could franchise these restaurants to the owners of the restaurants. Or you could be a shareholder in McDonald's. And again, for a kid, all I really wanted was a burger, but I ended up getting a great lesson <laughs> yeah, in business fries. model. Exactly. So, um, so from those beginnings, I ended up at University of Chicago. And while I was at University of Chicago studying economics, all I wanted to do was to be an entrepreneur like my father. So I started writing business plans. I borrowed um, some money from my mom, bought the first IBM PC and started writing business plans for ideas that I had. Uh, like a, at the time in the greeting card business, we only had, um, uh, the uh, Hallmark card company. So I came up with an idea of an alternative to Hallmark a card, wrote a business plan. 
and I ended up getting an interview with uh, Larry Levy, who is a wonderful entrepreneur in Chicago, built a very large company, Levy Restaurants, an international business and real estate developer. And I got an interview with him. I was 19 years old and I showed him the business plan. This is in 1980 or 81 when kids didn't have business plans back then. And he started to laugh and he thought it was really cute but he ended up hiring me and I ended up becoming like a special assistant or almost like a, a chief of staff for him. And that then really got me my, my start in, in, an, in my entrepreneurial journey. No, it's an interesting backstory. You think about the young entrepreneurs to name, the nature of business building, obviously, with cloud-based services and SaaS models, the barriers to entry to starting business aren't as high. And so you see a lot of people launching businesses, but their business plan often is predicated on fundraising, right? not actually creating revenue and cash flow. Right? How do you view the difference in young entrepreneurs now versus how you approach it with your father building a business that's not the type of thing that you're gonna IPO for a billion dollars, but is a real business that generates real you know, cash flows over, that creates wealth over a longer period of time? So I think that it's, um, uh, it, it, in many ways, it's, it's uh, the best of times and the worst of times when it comes to the question that you ask. In terms of the best of times, um, young entrepreneurs of this generation have access to the very best tools, um, business building uh, examples and um, business models, resources, like you mentioned, cloud-based um, infrastructure that can help you build a business and stand up a business very quickly. Um, examples like the the lean business model uh, methodology so it's the best of times um, from a what it takes to go and start a business and when i think about what it was back then for my dad or or even for me as the next generation that had a lot of advantages even just access to knowledge if you can believe it back in um in 1983 um, when i started what ultimately became sterling partners i found a book called how to do a leveraged buyout. And this was a self-published book by a gentleman, uh, Nicholas, I'll, I'll remember his name, and it looked like a Yellow Pages. It was a big paperback book, uh, courier type set, you know, very, very amateurish, but it basically outlined what bootstrapping was. And, and there, were, there weren't any, I don't think, that any of the firms that we know today had even really come into being yet when this happened. So imagine, it's almost like finding a treasure map. Back then, finding knowledge was incredibly difficult with a lot of friction. Now today, um, we have incredible access to examples. And so you have hyper learning where you can learn much, much faster now and iterate and evolve. So that's the best of times. I think the challenge is that for the next generation, I do think, my father used to say that the roots of great business decisions are all in small business. That, that, that person that had the small restaurant or that small business, the common sense, um, the way they had to manage their cash flow. Um, you know, Ram Charan talks about uh, understanding uh, inherently, the small business person understands inherently the way their cash cycle works because that's what they have to do to survive. And so I certainly do advise young entrepreneurs and people starting businesses um, today to take from that and to have that great common sense that comes from having a small business and the, the granular connectivity. You know, business is not an alien thing that's out here. It's everything. It's, it's, it's our humanity and people and all the things that come along with when you have people involved in decisions and an enterprise. And so we have to take all of that together and be very connected to it in order to ultimately have long-term success. I think the point you make about access to information is very true. Uh, I, every le lecture I had when I was at University of Georgetown is now free on iTunes University. Right? So yes. you know, I tell people, especially young people, you know, never let schooling get in the way of your education. Right? Uh, That's it's right. there if you want it. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it is. It's, it truly is the best of times. It's easy to get um, depressed or worried when you, know, when you read the press and what's going on. It's a very challenging time um, on our planet right now. But when you look at entrepreneurship and our ability to start things, to solve problems, to use entrepreneurship as a, a framework, a way of organizing ourselves and, and creating things, 
um, both in the for-profit and the nonprofit world, it's really the very best of times for people that want to innovate and to start and grow businesses. Yeah, you know, the word entrepreneurship itself, you know, you know, I've always, when I started Trust Vista, I spoke to one of my mentors and I said, I'm excited to be an entrepreneur now. And he said, what do you mean now? You've always been an entrepreneur. Right? And, and it was interesting the way he phrased it that way because that made me define what does it mean to really be an entrepreneur? Is it someone who starts a business or is it someone who really takes ownership of what they do? Right? And yes. in that regard, you know, even, you know, when I had a job and I was a W2 employee, I still behaved as my own boss in the sense that I took ownership of what I did. And I, I was interviewing a young analyst yesterday and was asking me about that startup experience. And I said, you know, one of the reasons a lot of businesses fail is that the person who starts it thinks that they want to do it because they want to be their own boss, right? They want to be the master of their own empire. And I always say, if you can give less than 100% when you have a boss, you can definitely give less than 100% when you don't. Right? Yes. Yes, I actually think when I think of mistakes in business, um, two of the biggest mistakes would be getting into entrepreneurship and not being all in and having that extreme ownership and being ready for the incredible challenges that you'll be faced with Again, it's the best of times. There are more, more tools and resources available for problem solving than ever before, but nevertheless, uh, all new efforts uh, require a lot of um, innovation and, and resiliency. I think the other big mistake that I know, I've noticed from having invested in 100 companies over, uh, over uh, my years is not recognizing the business that you're in, the actual business itself. I think sometimes um, people get away from the core of what the business is about, its reason for being, and they start making it about other things. So it could be that it's uh, all about us, the employees. That's an error because really customers would have a different point of view of that. Uh, it could be that we're not taking care of the people in our organization. That's a big mistake because they're the ones that are taking care of the customers. Um, so really staying connected to the core reason for being of a business. Why should people care? Why should it exist? That is one of the greatest lessons in business I ever learned. Yeah, I'd read this book, In Search of Excellence, that you may know right before I started Trust Vista, which helped shape you know kind of the mission and values I was going to bring to Trust Vista. But it was interesting in that book it was case studies about you know great companies that excellent companies built over decades, hundred years. Most of those companies don't exist. That book was written in the late 70s, early 80s. And you know some of them exist but aren't the companies you would think of as, as the great players. And obviously a lot of that has to do with the evolution of technology and you know the internet and people businesses didn't adapt. That's right. How do you advise the businesses, you know, you've invested in and built about keeping up with the times and, you know, not yes. getting stuck in the wrong thinking of what it is they are? So I think that um, when, I, again, looking at uh, the pattern recognition that comes from having seen so many things over a multi-decade career of investing and, and starting businesses, um, when I when I think about what the what those risks are, um, what happens is that you become so um, committed to the business that you have, to the product that you have, to the service that you have, that people are afraid to, um, to bring something new that might then ultimately take over what it is that you're currently running. And, and it's just a terrible mistake that we see. It's, it's also, by the way, a great opportunity for entrepreneurs where they're able to go after large businesses um, because once you're vested and invested in what it is that you're doing, um, to have the gumption and the wherewithal and the fortitude to go through and to actually break down something that you built over a long period of time is incredibly hard. And so the companies that do tend to survive and have a longer runway, they're evolving their business model, always getting better at what they do. And they're unafraid to create new products and services that may ultimately gobble up what it was that made them successful in the first place. And that's what we see with uh, companies that have that longer, that longer runway. Um, they're always evolving, they're always getting better, and they are always running, even if they didn't call it this, they're always running, in essence, experiments um, where it's, uh, it's intelligence and reconnaissance. They're gathering information from the future and testing those ideas and then seeing where there could be traction. And again, they're not afraid of setting up a skunk works 
and allowing a small team, almost like a SEAL team, to go in and to create something new, even though it may have significant consequences to the existing business they have. And we just see this over and over again um, in business, which again, the flip side of it is, it's a wonderful opportunity for entrepreneurs that are looking to disrupt and to get into the marketplace. You know, when I started Trustless, I had a few years of work experience, and I look back and thought, and think sometimes, you know, I could have had more and maybe avoided some of the mistakes and failures I've made. But no matter when you start, you're going to have some level of failure. There's always a first time. You started your first business basically right out of college. Right? I did. 1983, right, yes. Sterling Partners. Right? What That's was Sterling when you started it? So initially, and it's interesting looking back 30 years, um, the, what, what, what actually happened was there was a, a small predecessor. Um, I wrote a bit, my brother, my younger brother, Doug, had an idea for an optical memory card where you could store up to 800 pages of medical history on a credit card. And then also using technology of the time, mini computers um, before the, the PC age, uh, we developed a technology for adjudicating claims automatically for health insurance companies. Back then, uh, the doctors took essentially shoeboxes full of paper and sent these claims in to be processed, and we automated that process. So I wrote the business plan on that computer that I that I had gotten with my mom's sponsorship, and we ended up um, we 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 were funded by Blue Cross Blue Shield. So a group of of kids, um, literally, I had uh, I dropped out of University of Chicago one semester before graduation. My father actually sent me to see a psychiatrist because he thought the family was going backwards. Um, I'll never forget that. The gentleman's name was Dr. Logue. And after my uh, my 50 minute session with him, he asked if we needed investors for our technology company. I thought that was a good sign. Um, so then with my father's blessing, started that business and ultimately sold it to Blue Cross Blue Shield and started Sterling out of that successful exit. And what Sterling initially was, in today's world, we would call it a fundless sponsor. We, um, the best thing that could have happened to a group of, of young people that had been certainly lucky as much as anything else in our first startup was to go and to roll up our sleeves and buy small to medium sized companies in a rudimentary form of a buyout. And then these, we call these fixer uppers. These were companies that were undermanaged and undercapitalized and that we could turn around and improve performance and then ultimately exit. So our first generation from 1983 to 1999 was doing everything on a deal by deal basis. And it's so funny how the world comes around. Now there's a whole asset class of managers that, that that's their business model. Um, so that was an amazing way to stay granular and connected to the underlying business models and learning management and leadership and trial and error, all of those things. And uh, at the end of that period in 1999, we raised our first institutional fund, which then led to a series of eight funds and about six billion dollars um, invested in in growth capital. So that's how we got that's how we got started was from entrepreneurial beginnings. Yeah, I think you know one of the things that strikes me in that story is 1983 to 1999, right? 16 yes. years. Right, there that's are, right. are no shortcuts in building businesses. Often, you know, the headlines, the stories you hear, you know. Someone starts Instagram and with 13 employees, it sells it for, you know, amazing prices. But most businesses are built in the way you described, right? Slowly, incrementally, based on quality, and then scaling once you hit an inflection point. Now, in 1983, was private equity a household term? No, um, it really wasn't. I had the good fortune to have found that treasure map of a book, How to Do a Leverage Buyout. Um, and um, and no one no one um, seemed to know what it what it was. My father didn't. His financial advisors didn't. Um, and so it was a really interesting time to be able to go out and to find businesses. Um, they were certainly harder harder to finance, but also uh, much less expensive to buy. Multiples were low. Um, and uh, yeah, it was it was a really interesting time to be in the business. And, and so for me, because we had started as startup entrepreneurs, we really combined um, innovation because being having done a startup in technology in those early days and healthcare, we sort of felt that we had some insight into the toolkit around growth and innovation. We combined that with the early days of, of buyout and, and, and buying existing businesses and then applying those innovative ideas and, and energy to the business.
talking about succession planning for businesses, private equity itself is an industry that's evolved to be more institutionalized. And for the longest time, people who did private equity did it to create income and never really thought of succession planning, right? When the key man decides to hang it up, everyone starts their own shops and splinters. Now, Sterling, 1983, you built it and grew it for over 30 years. That's right. And you and I first met right at that tail end. That's right. Uh, in my retirement, and, the day the yeah. day before I retired. Yeah, you didn't tell me it was the day before you retired, uh, but I, I did find it very interesting that someone of your stature would take such an interest in what a trust asset could do. Because then you did have a follow up call with me. I remember that call very well. So does my wife, because we were on vacation in Portugal, hiking up a mountain, and I stopped halfway yeah. up the mountain so I wouldn't lose reception and spoke with you for an hour while sitting on a rock. But tell That's me. Right. What was that 32 years like? How did it evolve? How did your role evolve? And how did you know it was time to say, it's time for the next thing? Sure. So um, it was an amazing experience because it, it really ultimately um, came to uh, in, encompass all the things that I loved about business. Um, we had the entrepreneurial experience of having done startups even all the way through my career, we would continue to stand up companies when we saw a compelling opportunity. We were unafraid of starting something new if we thought that was a great idea. And some, when I look back at my track record, um, some of my greatest successes were ultimately investing in a company that we, that we created just as much as something that we bought and built. Um, so it had the entrepreneurial thread it had the business building thread. I've always, um, you know, like that kid who wants to build a sandcastle on the beach, I've always loved this idea of building and growing. Um, I've always loved curiosity. The reason that you and I met is because even the day before my retirement, I was still curious as to where, what was this idea that you had around outsourcing some of the um, core functions that we had, areas that sometimes we underinvested in, um, and you know the business was seemingly cyclical when we had capacity and we were and we needed to make new investments. We would double down with more intensity around finding new deals when we felt that we had a lot to manage. Sometimes that part of the business um, didn't get the resources it needed, and so you were providing a very interesting way of of more um, like force amplitude. You know, more bringing more resources to the table and being able to vary up that up and down depending upon what your client needed. So curiosity was a big part of that um, in the 30 years as well. I, there are many businesses I never would have been in if I hadn't you know, taken that meeting or met someone or, or that sort of uh, uh, serendipity. Um, but it was, an, it was an amazing career. I, I loved the business. We were able to work on culture. I love the people that I worked with. Um, we had a collegial atmosphere but, uh, that was supportive, but also very challenging and competitive. Uh, which was wonderful and, and important for building something over a long period of time. My retirement, and you know, when we were talking about doing this, you, you were interested in lessons learned, and so I'm, I'm um, you know, comfortable sharing what was probably the greatest challenge in my life. And when you and I met, um, I had was coming off of a terrible tragedy. Uh, my wife Jill and I had three children. Um, two boys who both went to University of North Carolina and, and did their entrepreneurship program and they're you know, following in dad's footsteps. My wife and I also had a beautiful daughter named Kara right in the middle, 21 years old. And when Kara was in college, um, she went to her summer job uh, in her 21st year, didn't feel well, turned out that she had leukemia. Um, at the time, the only curable form of leukemia. So we were quite optimistic um, after absorbing this news. And just very sadly, after four months of treatment, she passed away unexpectedly um, from complications from the treatment itself, not even really from the underlying disease. And what I will tell you, since we've talked about all the things I love about entrepreneurship and the great things that happen in a career, I will say, as a parent, when you've been great at problem solving, if you're not able to solve something like this that ultimately became life and death, it's really, really tough and became a very great challenge for me, um, worried about um, our sons, worried about my wife. And so that was the primary reason that I decided to retire at that stage in my life. And what I wanna share with everyone who might be listening to this is, is that facing that adversity and that loss, I learned something really important. Number one, you can come back from even something as awful as that, 
I thought at that time that could have been the end of me. Um, and it wasn't. And, uh, and that was an incredible learning. Um, the second thing that I learned is to try and live life without regret. And so, um, you know, whether it's the curiosity and taking that meeting that you might not have expected, um, having a kind word for someone that you might meet in your travels who's having a difficult day, mentorship and helping others in their careers, all the things that I think go into hopefully being a good human. Um, when you go through something tough like that, it really focuses you around what really matters in life and, and, give, and has given me a framework that I combine with that entrepreneurship that I've loved so much. And that is of really to my very best, to always do my best and to not have regrets in what we do. So the amazing thing about that comeback is that I, um, after a year of service with Jill, that was focused on um, helping to support kids in service projects around the US. We have a grant program where any child, uh, say age 11 to 20, can get a grant up to $1,000 to do a service project in their community. And after that year, as I reflected back on my career, I went back to our family office and started to do some investing, um, which Trevista supported me on, and, and I would never have gotten started with if I didn't have access to those resources, because I was really trying to find my way. And what ultimately happened is I looked back on my career, I realized that being a private equity partner and an entrepreneur, a CEO, I'd started and built companies, that many times the cobbler's children have no shoes. And what would have been a platform that if I had had it during the different phases of my career, in my 20s, when I was seeding things and highly entrepreneurial, in my 30s, when I was building things, in my 40s, when um, suddenly things like philanthropy and giving back became uh, something and, and dealing with children and educating the next generation and my family and all of those things. And, and then in my 50s, dealing with aging parents, what could have been a platform that could have sort of powered me through all those amazing business experiences? And I went out looking for it, thinking it might be a multifamily office, it might be you know, one of the great firms that many of us have used in our careers that help us in wealth management, but has other aspects to it. And I couldn't find it. And so ultimately, um, what it led to was starting uh, Crescent Capital, um, which, uh, which is what I'm the chairman of now. And it's really a, a platform to support CEO founders and private equity partners with a shared family office or an agile family office that encompasses everything from um, the typical wealth advisory, but to deep planning and estate tax and all the things that relate to helping us keep what we earn, our fair share of it, um, to thinking about the next generation and how to, how to talk to your kids and, and have a great family meeting, um, to philanthropy, you know, helping people find their focus on what they might want to help the, you know, the, the people coming behind them in business, uh, helping them get ahead or helping their community, um, and then creating a community. So similar to doing this podcast today, so we're talking to uh, a community about these ideas, and we've done that now with Crescent itself, creating a community of CEO founders and private equity partners that can share ideas as well on that and their families. So. It's been a wonderful kind of next iteration that I never would have expected um, if it wasn't for that journey that, that brought me to this place. Yeah, well, thank you sharing, for sharing that uh, deeply personal story. And I think your experiences are certainly unique and how you've married a long career of experience to building Crescent is quite exceptional. There are certainly a lot of private equity firms trying to roll up RIAs and you know investing behind the idea of wealth management. But not really anyone with your experience saying, I'm running the platform and deeply involved in, in marrying these ideas, almost to the point where I would say you created a new class or a new age of LPs. Yes, um, it's true. Uh, it's having true. been the GP and having fundraised and having you know institutional LPs in the pensions and endowments insurance companies, having high net worth individuals, having fund of funds, you really created something new here. How do you see what you're building disrupting private equity over the next 10, 20 years? Sure. So the, um, you know, of course, as someone who made my, my, my wealth through private equity, I have such appreciation for that industry and for the business model and my, my colleagues there. And, and I invest in private equity and continue to. Um, but I think what's interesting about this platform that we've built is that 
it combines um, at, at a deeply personal level all the things that I felt would have made life better and a little bit easier along the way in a career. So the first would be having a big tent. So when I was 28 years old, I was turned down by um, a very highly respected firm, one who may be one of my fellow clients, uh, a fellow client of yours. Um, I was turned down saying that I didn't, I was 28, that I didn't meet their minimum um, for their wealth advisory business. Can I ask time. you, did you ever finish your degree from Chicago? I did not. Um, I did not. I've talked to them about it. I've thought about uh, going <laughs> going back or even their University of North Carolina where my boys um, went and loved it so much. Uh, but no, I, I, I haven't. Um, and, so you were uh, definitely one of those people who did not let schooling get in the way of your education. No, it, it, it's absolutely right. And it was a different time. I mean, now, you know, we've seen such an incredible change in the thinking around this and people understand like what a true apprenticeship is and the value of that. So for the first time, I think in many years, it's uh, become less controversial to consider these alternatives to traditional education. Back then it was, uh, you know, heresy, uh, which th thus the visit to the psychiatrist. Um, yeah. But, uh, but what, what's been wonderful about this business model is it has um, encompassed all these things that at those different phases of life, first the big tent, so you have to, in my mind, be open to taking in you know, young CEOs and young private equity partners earlier in their career, if you're going to be there for them as they build success. And by the way, I think it's a wonderful, these are wonderful individuals to bet on uh, their future. Um, and so that's one part of it. I think the next part of it is having a service set that can uh, encompass the things that you need in different phases of your life. Like if you do great estate and tax planning early in your career, the benefits of that later in your career can be extraordinary. Um, so, you know, planning is an incredibly important thing um, in those earlier in those earlier years. And then as the decades go on, I mean, think of the private equity partner who's had a great career at a firm and now is thinking of starting their own firm. So now their needs are going from being a senior person at a firm that they hopefully helped build and whatnot to now going and starting something new. They need some support around doing that. They're going to be taking a big risk on themselves, writing a big check, all the things that go along with that. So having a platform that can do all of those things was part of the original vision. Um, to me, the second part of it was making it employee owned. So at Crescent, everyone from the person that greets you when you walk in the door uh, or picks up the phone when you might call, everyone up and down the line is an owner of the firm. And interestingly enough, the firm is almost 30% owned by clients, which I think is, is also awesome and healthy and, and good for keeping focus. My brother always said, follow the customer. So that's a wonderful way of doing it. Um, and what this has led to is um, we started this in August of 2017. Um, Avi Stein, another private equity uh, uh, partner, and myself, we were the first two clients. My brother followed shortly thereafter and a few friends. We finished the first year at about $2.8 of AUM, all organic. Uh, these were people that came from firms that we all know the names of and brought, uh, and brought their uh, accounts over. Second year, we finished at $6 billion. Um, again, just about all organic. And then we just finished our third year at uh, $12 billion of assets under, under management, of which over $9 billion was 100% organic. My, my father used to say that um, people vote with their feet. And so we have $9 billion uh, that has come from people bringing their accounts from other uh, you know, wonderful firms, but wanting this holistic integrated solution that really goes well beyond traditional wealth management and encompasses, I think, all the things that make for hopefully having a, a better life, how you work with your family and your kids as a parent yourself, and how you will ultimately have highly function, highly functioning kids and a family that stays together. You know, that's a huge uh, definition of success in a, in a life. And then how you will build your career and build your business and all the things that go along with that and how you'll manage taxes, which is a, a fact of life and a very important consideration. Um, and then when you want diversification, how will you uh, accomplish diversification over time and end up with both the passive income that you'll need for the freedom to be able to do what you want, start new businesses, retire, uh, do philanthropy and volunteer, whatever it might be. How do you do all of that um, and build that diversified portfolio for that phase of your life, which came earlier for me than, than I'd ever expected, but opened my eyes to what the possibilities are. 
Uh, well, I think one of the things that that's driven your organic growth is you've created access to alternatives that weren't there for people who were part of the, you know, large wealth management firms, not naming any names, right? They could get you yeah. into a slice of the next mega fund, but not into that interesting middle market fund or that independent sponsor led deal. So, you know, you've really created access. And I think that's also created a proliferation of those smaller firms who now can get capital who would otherwise be ignored. Because if you're a $500 million fund, you're not creating enough product to be pushed through a big money manager. No question. Um, what we've done and the, the, the secret of it, if there really is a secret, um, is to think the way a $12 billion single family office would. And if we think of the evolution of the family office sector, which is becoming better organized now and more of an institutional investment um, sector of its in its own right. Uh, but if you think the way that a $12 billion single family office would, what you would ultimately do is find great managers, of course. And so we continue to um, support the industry and invest in um, we think great managers and many times try and partner with them where I can offer my expertise of having built a private equity firm and help a young manager to build their practice, to build their, their business. So that's certainly one part of it. The other thing that a very large single family office would do is co-invest, uh, which is economically very compelling um, and that's part of it. And then the third area is that where there are opportunities for a family to invest directly where appropriate uh, to take advantage of those as well. And so we've really done all three. We, we back great managers and support them as a great LP. We are very, very active in co-investment and taking advantage of that. You know, many times when I was a private equity executive, people would ask about co-invest, but then they couldn't execute quickly and, and really actually go do it when those opportunities came up. We're the opposite, we're ready to go. Um, and then access, doing some direct investing, which we've done in some really interesting areas. In 2017, when the uh, new tax act was passed and the qualified opportunity zones became an opportunity, we did deep research and we looked for managers back then and there weren't any because it was a completely new area. And frankly, in real estate, it was hard to find managers who had a business model around owning an asset for 10 years plus. It just wasn't the nature of the way carried interest and hold periods were working. So we ended up starting one um, and actually a great um, life circle. I mentioned wonderful mentor Larry Levy earlier in this conversation. We incubated Crescent in Larry Levy's family office in Chicago. He ended up uh, becoming a client and on the advisory board. And then when the QOZ came out, he had a direct uh, real estate team that primarily partnered with a wonderful firm out of Houston called Heinz. Uh, they're, I think, second largest developer in the world. And so Larry brought Heinz and his investment team of real estate professionals, and we partnered with them. And we, we were able to create, which is something that I would say is certainly amongst the top, um, you know, top, top decile, um, if not better, uh, QOZ uh, managers. Uh, and we've also done it in other areas. We have clients that are very interested in secondaries. And so we've created a secondaries capability where someone wants to own SpaceX and we're able to get that for them. Um, so across the board, whether it's secondaries, whether it's uh, the incredible tax benefits of QOZ and long-term institutional quality real estate, you don't let taxes drive the investment decision, um, all the way through to Industrial real estate, which is a huge opportunity, as we've seen through the pandemic, what's happened with e-commerce logistics um, to uh, now we actually have a, a wonderful strategy where we support the RIA industry by buying minority stakes up to 30 percent in an RIA. And we also support the private equity and asset management industry by buying anywhere from five to 20% of, uh, of, of, of the GP uh, of, of firms that are working on succession and, and maybe need some liquidity. So we've been able to take those areas that we felt that we could bring some very real value and, and manage with intensity. And we've done those as well as curation, finding great managers and being great LPs. Fantastic. Well, Eric, I want to thank you so much for giving your time today. It's been a wonderful conversation. I know our audience is going to be very appreciative of you sharing your thoughts. Absolutely. And, and I wouldn't leave this conversation without saying thank you, because when I think about that moment of time 
of kind of retiring from a great career, sort of entering the great unknown of what I might have been working on, having access to the resources of your organization in a manner that made it, you made it easy to say yes, you know, as opposed to going out and trying to build my own team at that very early days and do the research and all the things that needed to be done, very high bar. And, um, and so that meeting that we had the day before my retirement, I consider it very fortuitous uh, that it happened and very appreciative of, uh, of the relationship that we have, very happy with it. Likewise, it's been a privilege to be your partner and see how you've grown uh, Crescent to Amazing Heights in such a short time. We look forward to being uh, your partners in the journey. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Really nice to be with you. And with that, we come to the end of this episode of the Press Star Talk podcast. Thank you to our listeners and we would love for you to subscribe, rate and leave a review wherever you access podcasts. Please follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter to stay updated on additional content. To know more about how we support our clients on due diligence, business development, portfolio management, fund administration, data analytics and other areas, feel free to visit our website and reach out to us at www.tresvista.com. Any information, opinions and recommendations presented by our speakers are their own and do not represent the views of their firms or Tres Vista and should not be constituted as investment advice.